Hi, JJ. Welcome to the show. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you. And, uh, you know, I've been following your work for a while and you're obviously a, a major influencer in the movement of health and wellness uh, in the world. You know, you're really out there changing a lot of lives and um, you seem to have a big passion for it. And you've obviously dealt a lot with people's relationship to food in your work um, and their bodies and how to get well. And so I thought a good starting point is just, you know, a little snippet of your story, like what got you so excited and motivated, really? What got you so motivated that you're like, I'm going to devote myself to this and, and make sure there a change is happening? I know it's so funny. People go, okay, so how did this all start? What was your why? I go, well, my first why was just to never have to get a job. You know, <laughs> it's like, that huh. was the first why. Um, you know, I was very fortunate. I grew up in Berkeley, California, and I was always into health and fitness. Like, uh, you know, I was teaching dance class in high school and teaching calisthenics back then. We did not have any of these other things. And I started studying nutrition in high school and going to the health food store and reading everything I could. My mom was from the Midwest. She thought I was nuts, like nuts. You know, she would make casseroles and, and was upset with me because I wouldn't eat these things. And then I went off to UCLA as a theater major and uh, promptly dropped out of that because it didn't seem like the right use of my time. And by the time I graduated from UCLA, I had a full-blown business as a personal trainer. And back then, this was years and years and years ago, there were no personal trainers. It was me, Body by Jake, Mark Sisson. And what I discovered pretty quickly, I then was in grad school in exercise physiology, and it was so clear that you could not out-exercise a poor diet. So when I got into doctoral school, I started studying nutrition and aging, kind of ran out of classes in exercise science. I started studying nutrition. I got obsessed with nutrition and then hormones. And, you know, then you go down all of that rabbit hole. And what I started to see was when I was working with people, I'd be at their houses, you'd help one person in the family, and then you'd have this trickle effect. And what I realized was that most of the people were not where they wanted to be in their health, not because they didn't want to be healthy. It was because they were following the wrong set of rules. They honestly didn't know quite what to do. There was so much misinformation. They were basically being duped by misinformation. I mean, you see that now. And so I would see that, gosh, I'd go into a family. I'd help one person start to trickle to the whole family. And I just wanted to help more people. And I just first was just like, how do I help a million people. That was my big question. And here I am. I'm a personal trainer and a nutritionist. I'm seeing people one by one. So that is a crazy big goal, right? How do you help a million people? Next thing I know, and I always think that when you ask the right questions, right, those answers show up. I mean, literally, next thing I know, I'm on Dr. Phil every week in his weight loss challenges. Okay, so, wait, so how did, how did that happen right? exactly? So how does what, that happen? What was the story um, there? So... I was um, living in Palm Springs at the time and I was um, on local TV, which was really important because you don't want to go on national TV if you have not done any little local TV. So I'd done a lot of little local TV. I was real comfortable on the camera. I also knew all the weird things not to do anymore on TV that you do when you first start. And I was editing a lot of my own TV segments because I was doing these things called medical minutes. So I was really looking at myself closely and, and, and coaching myself. I was helping a doctor with her, her online business, Dr. Diana Schwartzbein. I was at an IFM conference and a doctor came up to me and said, hey, you've been helping that doctor. I need help. I'm the doctor on the Dr. Phil show. I go, all right. So I went to help him with the weight loss challenge shows. I was so used to being on TV. I walked in. No one knew who I was. This is what so, was so funny. I walk in and I just started doing my thing. I brought in a big Tanita scale. I started helping with diet. They all just assumed I was supposed to be there. This was on the very first house shows. And so I was there for a couple of days. And then I was supposed to fly. Gene Simmons was my client at the time. I was supposed to get on a plane with Kiss and go somewhere. And, uh, and I remember I'm saying, hey, I got to go. And the doctor's like, you know, you really should stay. And I went, really? Because I'm supposed to go on this plane with, you know, <laughs> with kiss, you know, because no, 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 you really need to stay. So I stayed 
And that started two years on Dr. Phil that eventually I left because I got a primetime pilot. Nice. So it was like Kiss or Dr. Phil, Kiss Kiss or Dr. Phil, Dr. Phil. I think I made the right choice. And, um, but what was really interesting about all of that was, you know, you think about it, go, how do I help a million people? Well, you're on Dr. Phil. I think there was like 13 million viewers on his show every day. And I go, well, check that box. So what's the next question you would ask once you do that? How do you help a billion people? How do you help a billion people? And you don't do it yourself. Like I didn't do it myself. I did it because I was on the Dr. Phil show and I had that reach there and I was able to get that message out to more people. And then I realized, all right, well, I learned through Dr. Phil how to do TV. I learned how to launch a book. I learned how to do speaking. And so I started helping other healthcare practitioners do the same because, you know, I met so many people over the years. I used to do a lot of practice development and I would meet the smartest doctors, the smartest healthcare professionals who had such an important message to get out into the world. But let's face it, when you really look at what it takes to go through medical school, it's kind of the antithesis of what it takes to be an entrepreneur. It's like they almost kill you any entrepreneurial spirit in you. Follow the rules, follow the process, do this this way, right? And for the most part, what I see with a lot of the um, practitioners is they hate sales, they hate marketing, mainly because they don't realize that if you want to be a really good practitioner, if you really want to change the world, you have to be amazing at sales and marketing because you have to get people to eat more broccoli, go to sleep, drink their water, have good relationships, you know, believe in something bigger than themselves. That's all sales and marketing, right? It absolutely is sales and marketing. And that's that's one of the... I think you put the, your finger on the pulse there uh, of how difficult, just as a physician myself, it is to overcome this programming that you're talking about mm-hmm. of that, you know, talking about broccoli and hydration is not understanding that that's a sales conversation. In right. The first place. And, and it, you know, early on, I was teaching before, uh, before Dr. Phil, I was going around the country teaching this course called Overcoming Weight Loss Resistance. And it was two days of clinical stuff. All the things could get in the way of you losing weight and cause you to gain weight. And then one day of sales and marketing. And I remember I was using the word sell. And one of the doctors came up to me and she goes, you got to stop using that word. I go, what word? What are you talking about? She goes, sell. (laughs) You know, I thought she was going to say, stop swearing. I was like, I haven't been, you know, sell. I'm like, oh, I go, you actually need to get over this and understand that if you want to be the most effective practitioner you're a salesperson, right? You've got to sell them first on this bit, bigger, better vision for themselves. You've got to sell them on that they're worth it to do that. And then you've got to sell them on what they have to do to get there. Because when you move outside an allopathic model, a pill, you know, a pill for an ill model, it's all self-responsibility and behavioral change and these things that we have to do. And that requires sales. Uh, and I think it also requires a different mindset, you know, which is something that you talk about a lot in in your teaching and your in your books. And I'm wondering about um, this book that that came out after uh, your son was injured so severely, uh, which was first called Miracle Mindset, and then republished as Mirac- as as Warrior Mom. Is that correct? The, yes, the, because or, okay. you know it was so interesting, and it just shows you you can change a book title. Um, I never, that title never resonated with me, but we couldn't figure out the title. (laughs) So I was like, and that's what the publishers want. I'm like, all right. And I was doing an interview with Dr. Mark Hyman and his team was like, we had to have you. It was for Broken Brain series. He goes, we had to have you. You're such a warrior mom. And I'm like, oh my gosh, the title, right? So you can change the title of the book in case you were wondering, you know, everyone's worried about not publishing something till they have it perfect. It's like, just get it out there can do a lot of good. So That's a yes, great I, story. Wrote, I wrote the book Miracle <laughs> Mindset. My son, when my son was 16, and instantly this was literally a month before The Virgin Diet was being published. And I had put everything into that book. Like I invested everything. I'm the primary financial support for my family. Like this book has to go where we're bankrupt. And now my son is, is lying in the pediatric ICU, hovering between life and death in a coma and uh, this book is coming out. And so the Warrior Mom book is written about 
the mindset, what, what, the, what the mindset was behind how I showed up, how I was able to show up through those times. It's not about my son surviving. It's about what it takes, how you have to show up when times are tough, like they are now, um, because those are the defining moments. You know, I can't think of one day in my life where everything went perfectly. You know, I got flowers, um, great dinner, and I looked at the end of the day and I went, boy, I became a better person today right? That is not when we grow. There is no growth inside your comfort zone. It's when things get tough that you really see who someone is. And, and the cool thing is, is when you go through those challenging times, it, it, it's, you build that muscle and then things get easier. When my son got hit, I had never faced anything like that before, but I'd faced a lot of tough times in my life. And I spent a long time really learning, um, the mindset you needed to be able to show up during these times. So I was prepared, as prepared as you can be, for nearly losing your 16-year-old child. So um, a lot of people, when they face really severe events like this, like having a, a, a child who is nearly killed in a hit-and-run accident, will collapse or they'll freeze or they'll, they'll go into some kind of uh, trauma response. And I'm wondering... Is, how do how would you ascribe your capacity, this ferocious capacity that you have to to stay connected to that uh, growth mindset? I would say, um, is that something about how you were raised or things that you went through, or how would you explain that? You know, it's so funny. Well, when I wrote the book, um, everyone because everyone was saying, "How did you do that?" And I'm like, "I don't know." You know, <laughs> they go, "Where did you learn that?" I go, "It just was in me." And I write the whole book and I talk about the different mindset hacks really that I had. And then about a year after I write this book, I'm doing an interview and someone's like, well, how did you learn those? And I went, oh, they were so ingrained in me that I forgot even learning them, but I did learn them, which is really important because the fact that I learned them means anyone can learn them. And they, the, at the time I learned them, who knew that this would actually be the differentiator for my son? This is why my son is here today is because of what I learned. And so when I was in my 20s, I was in Florida, I had a client and she was a super successful woman in a multi-level marketing company. She was a Hawaiian blue diamond in new skin. And I was her personal trainer. And I was at the time at University of Miami in grad school. And I remember walking down you know, the beach with her and she goes, so what are you going to do? Why are you in school? And I go, oh, I want to be more successful. I want to help more people. She goes, huh, all right. Huh, what are you going to do when you graduate? I go, I'm going to go get my doctoral, doctorate. And she goes, interesting. Why are you going to do that? And I go, well, because I want to be more successful. I want to help more people. And she goes, huh, huh. She goes, well, you know, you don't need to do all that to make more money. And I remember at the time I was in my 20s, I go, this is not about money, right? You know, in your 20s, you're like, you don't have kids, you don't have any of these things and, and like, you don't have to worry about money. And then uh, all of a sudden reality hits like houses and mortgages and kids and all that. So I'm like, this is not about the money. I just want to help the world. It's all impact. She goes, okay. She goes, well, when you're interested, she goes, at, at the age 30, that's going to shift. And when you're really interested in learning how to build a business, call me. She totally, she totally like um, future paced me on this thing. And I just was like, yeah, right. This lady's crazy. And the other thing I didn't really think about at the time was this, this woman was so successful. She was a high school graduate who grew up in a trailer park in Kansas. So on my 30th birthday, she sent me a um, videotape, just shows how old I am. She sent me a videotape and the videotape was about trading time for money, and how to create true wealth and true impact in the world. And it was for an MLM company. It was when New Skin launched their first nutrition product line. I looked at that and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is it. This is what I need to do with my life. This is how I make big impact. I sold my personal training business. I dropped out of my PhD program and I moved into her house in Florida <laughs> because she was going to teach me how to be successful. So in I move and I've now sold everything I've sold my business. I've dropped out of my PhD program. I sold my car. I still got rid of all my furniture. I'm at her house, like, you know, two suitcases. Here I am. And she puts rubber bands on my wrist. And she says, um, anytime you have a limiting belief, snap your wrist and say, cancel, cancel. 
Now I'm looking at my, I'm thinking, I have just dropped out of a PhD program. I have sold my business. I've gotten rid of everything. And I have two rubber bands on my wrist and I'm supposed to say cancel, cancel. I'm like, why am I so impulsive? What is wrong with me? You know. And, uh, but you know, I was already there. So for six months, she coached me on mindset. It turned out that in New Skin, that was her role. She was the mindset coach. And her whole vision had been that I was going to become her protege, that she was my Mr. Miyagi. I was going to become the, you know, she was stepping out. I was going to become this mindset coach. And so for months, I mean, all I did, I had a Sony Walkman with tapes. I listened to Augmentino. I listened to Think and Grow Rich. I listened to everything that, you know, everything, Napoleon Hill and Brian Tracy, just over and over and over. She taught me to fiercely manage my environment. That negative in was negative out. So no news, no negative people. And just to every morning, wake up three things that I'm grateful for, write them down, have that vision, have that clear goal of what I wanted in life and just boom, boom, boom. That's what I did. And so when my son got hit, I had already known how to do this. So my son gets hit and I remember looking at him after, you know, the doctor told us to let him die. And we told the doctor we were overruling him is when he got to the hospital and the, the second hospital, we got him airlifted out of the first one and got him to Harbor UCLA Trauma Center. And after he survived the surgery that the first doctor said he wouldn't survive and he survived the airlift and I sat with him, held his hand. He's in a deep coma. I've got two fingers I'm holding because everything else is bandaged um, or in a cast or covered with road rash. And I just said, Grant, you're going to be 110%. And your name means warrior. I need you to fight. I'm going to bring in everybody that needs to help you. I said, we've got this. You fight 110%. That was my mantra. That's all I went for. And that's all I allowed in my mind. You know, um, I believe the thoughts create. I believe you get what you expect. And I just decided I'm going to only see 110%. I'm not going to let anything else get into my mind because I was so afraid that I've even entertained even slightly less than that, that would be there. And I thought, you know, I mean, later on, you kind of realize, okay, if he doesn't quite hit that, it's totally fine. It's better than the zero that the doctors wanted, you know, telling us to let him die. And so I used all the tools that Kay had taught me of getting up in the morning, knowing what you're grateful for, do knowing how to do state shifts if you start to get into a negative place, um, calling for help, being vulnerable. Uh, and really, one of the biggest things that Kay always taught me was the only limitations are the limitations in your mind. And so when you believe that, you go for something insane, like 110%, something that doesn't exist. And the crazy part is prior to the accident, my son... Um, had been diagnosed with bipolar. Now, he he is the exact reason you you all are doing the work that you're doing. He was taken, you know, I took him to a psychiatrist at age five. Within five minutes, that psychiatrist had diagnosed him with ADD, OCD, um, some impulse control thing, and um, rapid cycling bipolar. Like five minutes. And um, I know, it, it was so insane. It's what actually at that time I dropped out of, um, I was back in, in grad school for nutrition and I dropped out of the, class, the school I was in and went and studied pharmacology because I thought, you know what, I'm going to learn these pathways. I'm going to learn what's going on because at the time we had to have him on some psych meds because if we didn't, he was suicidal. And I said, I'm just going to do every single test. I'm going to look at heavy metals and gluten and methylation and dairy. <laughs> like, I'm going to do every single thing I need to to help figure it out. And uh, the thing that I didn't figure out back then, because it really wasn't talked about way back then, was neuroinfections. Pandas was just starting to come out when Grant was around, I think, 12. Uh, but he'd never really had straps, so that wasn't the issue. But when he was a little, little kid, probably around two, um, Grant got Lyme and Bartonella. And... Um, after this whole thing, seven years into him on his healing journey from this traumatic brain injury, uh, one of the doctors in Mindshare, Dr. Kat Toops, got in, I got introduced to her through Dr. Sarah Gottfried, and she said, have you ever checked for this? And sure enough, we found it. And I worked with her. I worked with another doctor, Dr. Glenn Wilcox, who does testing out of Africa in a specific therapy out of Africa. And we have gotten rid of all of it. 
and my son is 110%, 110%, better than before the accident. And it's, uh, you know, these things are all possible if you just keep, I, I kept asking the question. We got stuck at 60%. We got stuck at 70%. We got, I, you know, and I tried so many therapies that didn't work or that just worked a little bit, but I just kept mm. turning the rocks over, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's such a, you know, that's such a powerful story of like, first of all, warrior mom who's right, devoted to going down the rabbit hole as far as you could possibly go uh, to discover what's going on. And um, I, I think what's so challenging for people is that we have a lot of information now. I mean, in terms of what we know causes a lot of these problems, especially in the mental health. And mm -hmm. we, the information's out there, but what's so challenging is, is that um, there's not a lot of providers necessarily that have it all in one place. There, it's scattered. Um, you really have to be very well organized and resourced to find it. Um, and, and, you know, that's obviously what our work is, is trying to bring it together in one place. But I'm, I'm like curious to you, like, it seems like you, when we, we've been talking a lot about mindset, it just seems like there's something inside of you uh, as a person that won't stop until you feel like you're getting to the truth or something. Is that right? Well, especially with your kids. Oh my gosh. Like, uh, you know, um, I mean, pretty much with everything, but especially with your kids. Like I remember being in the hospital and wanting to put my son on high dose fish oil. Like it's obvious I've got, he's got a traumatic brain injury and the hospital's not letting me. So I just did it anyway. Like, I was like, okay, you know, we will do this behind your back if you're not going to let us do this. Um, so, you know, you've got to be an advocate for yourself and then for your kids. Like, you just have to be. Um, but I think a lot of that comes from just some ideas about self-worth and self-confidence, right? You know, I think there's this, this idea that someone else must know better. Well, I think that we we are all our own best healthcare CEO and that, you know, you're gathering information, putting it together to make those right decisions. It is really challenging. And I'm just so grateful to know what you guys are doing because, oh my gosh, you're right. I mean, it is, here's the big challenge in mental health. And this is what I faced in the hospital. Here I have all this information. I sent out this SOS. I mean, Dr. Daniel Lehman's coming into the hospital, Dr. Hyla Cass, like all these people. The doctor's like, who are you? And why are all these people here, <laughs> you know? Um, and But yet they would listen to them. Like they had their ways they were going to do this stuff. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. Like if you look at the, the, the information on brain injury and fish oil, it's really pretty clear. Like the there's... The risk isn't there. It's all reward. And they still were thinking he was going to have a brain bleed from it. I'm like, this zero research to show that. So it is an interesting situation where I think that we've had doctors on pedestals for so long. And, you know, if I kept that first doctor on the pedestal, I would not have a son because the first doctor on, on that we talked to at Palm Springs um, Desert Hospital well, he worked in the ICU there. Well, in Palm Springs, most of the people coming in are 70 plus years old. It's very different for a 70 plus year old person coming in with a severe traumatic brain injury and 13 fractures in a torn aorta than a 16 year old, you know? Yeah. You know, so well, yeah. th that was his lens. I get it. But the other doctor that it was, it was interesting. The, um, there was a neurosurgeon there who said, hey, he's still got brain activity. And I go, what would you do if it was your kid? He goes, I would absolutely airlift him. It's like no one wanted to upset the big guy. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, I don't care if you're upset. So, JJ, what do you tell people? You know, a lot of people are, are going in circles around their physical health, their mental health, right? They're, it's mm -hmm. like they're hearing in the chatter. They're hearing all this great stuff, but they're spinning in circles. They can't solve the puzzle of why are they not getting better? Why are they not getting fitter? Why are they not getting healthier relationships? Like they can't solve the mm -hmm. puzzle. Just like, I don't know how to cut through. What in all this time of being exposed to thousands and thousands of people, like what would you tell somebody about like, how do you cut through that circle that they've been in for so long where it's like, I don't know 
really what to do next. I've been trying a bunch of random things for some. Yeah. You know, one of the things that's really important, like I look at my world that I work in the most is weight loss. And here's the challenge with weight loss is we look at one metric, the scale, to decide if someone's being successful on their journey. The challenge is if you are super metabolically unhealthy, the scale might be the last thing to change. And other things may change much more quickly, but you don't look at them. So you just assume what you're doing isn't working. We have to redefine the whole way we look at what, you know, in business we call KPIs, the key performance indicators, to indicate whether someone's on the right path. And I'm excited about all that we're doing with personalized medicine and nutrigenomics because we are all different, but we also have some basic things that like, if you want to start getting healthier, there's some basic things that, that are going to help all of us. The most important basic thing to make the change on everything is to realize that your self-care has to be your number one priority above all else. When my son was hit that second night in the hospital, first night in the hospital was like making the decision to overrule the doctor and driving from Palm Springs to LA, not knowing if we were going to, to have a son still alive when we got there. The second full night, he'd survived that, that um, surgery. He'd now been moved to the pediatric ICU. And I looked at him and I went, all right, I am not going to, like, I'm not leaving my son. The, one of the leading causes of death, of course, is death by doctor in the hospital, not because the doctor did it, but it's a teaching hospital. And uh, I need to make sure this book goes so I can pay for all this. How the heck am I going to accomplish this? And I thought, you know, the only way I'm going to be able to pull all this off, I can't be sick walking into the ICU, can't even have a sniffle. I have to put my self-care first. And, you know, for most people, especially women, that is so counterintuitive. They put themselves at the bottom of the list if they even make the list at all. And so I think the first mindset shift is to realize that self-care is not a selfish act. It's a selfless act. That if you are going to show up and be able to lead your family, be, do things for your community, then you can't do that if, you're, if your health is not there. So self-care has to be top. Has to be top. And and. For a lot of people, it's not there because of a self-worth issue. When I queried my community a couple of years ago and I said, hey, you know, if you're not where you want to be with your health, your weight, why not? And I thought, well, they're going to probably tell me they can't quit the gluten or the sugar or whatever. They don't have time. You know, the typical excuses. It's like, I don't have time. I don't have money. I can't quit sugar. Well, that is not what the majority of people who wrote in said. They said, I don't feel good enough. I'm not worth it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, well, that's a lot bigger thing. So that first thing is realizing, hey, you're here for a reason and you can't do those things if you are not taking good care of your health. Like, so that has to be the number one decision that you make. And when you have that decision that I'm going to prioritize my self-care, then take the first step. Now, you wouldn't run a marathon by trying to do it all. Like if you're going to run a 26 mile marathon, it doesn't happen in a minute, right? It happens over hours. You don't become healthy overnight. It's a daily practice of small steps. This is where I love BJ Fogg's Tiny Habits book. You start with one thing, then the next. Sadly, it's not what is pushed out into the world of like, you know, you're, you're going to start New Year's and you're going to start you're going to start exercising and you're going to start sleeping well and you're going to start meditating and you're going to go keto and do intermittent fasting and take your supplements. And it's like, stop it, you know, start the new year and say, this is all about self-care. And the first thing that I'm going to start with is adding more vegetables into my diet. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to step on the scale every single day, not thinking that's judging me as right or wrong, but just so that I have that point of reference to know how food and other lifestyle habits are impacting me. It is not an emotional judge, <laughs> right? We would never put a blood glucose, continuous gl glucose monitor on us and think of it some kind of like emotional judge, but we do it with the scale. So you just start with one thing at a time, next thing, build on it, build on it, build on it. And then you find those people, those healthcare professionals who you trust and also 
who work as a team and work as guides and help you along the way. Like, you know, when you find that healthcare professional who will not work with anybody else and it's only their way, I'm like, come on, you know, you can't be the expert of everything. So I always look for who's, how's, how can I assemble an amazing team who are open-minded and will look at, look at everything and then track everything in your journal because you're ultimately going to be the one that's knowing if something's working for you or not by how you feel. And we've got to connect the dots between how we're eating, how we're moving, how we're living and how we're feeling. Well, yes, <laughs> just like, yes, 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 yes. Um, so, so many dimensions of, uh, that we could go to from here, JJ. Um, I, I really appreciate the breadth of your vision and, and, and connect with it around how many different um, elements make for wholeness or make, make for uh, wellness. Um, and they're all connected together through our psychology and through uh, the mindset to get there. Um, mm -hmm. And it's a I process like, and a journey, right? You know? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, when you said that a lot of people, um, in particular women, are, um, I would say, programmed by um, a cultural forces to, you know, put their needs behind the needs of um, others. Um, I see the same thing in healthcare providers and the difficulty in a training that really um, teaches you to, you know, in, in residency and medical school, not even go to the bathroom, uh, not sit down, um, you know, admit patients for 24 hours straight. Um, you know, it goes when on and on. When is that going to change? That is the most insane thing when you it's really... dehumanizing. And it's like they say, oh, it's for training so that you'll be able to do that. I go, but you can't train your body to deal with sleep deprivation. That's ridiculous. <laughs> you know, that's just... Right. Uh, you know. Well, you know, there, there's also a downside to limiting. Um, and, you know, as a physician, it's a little hard for me to even say those words. But I remember I used to be an advocate for um, wages for house staff when I was a resident. And we would go to the faculty every year and we would ask for modest raises from, say, 31000 a year to 32000 a year. And we would complain about being worked too hard. And the head of the surgery department said, look, do you want a surgeon who graduates in five years who's going to do your appendectomy to have 1,500 appendectomies under his belt? Or do you want him to have 50 appendectomies under his belt because he wasn't worked too hard as a resident? And I thought, oh, that's a good point. But there are these um, issues, right? So it's, it's balance. It's like, how mm -hmm. do we get enough experience in a short amount of time where you're not a resident for 15 years, <laughs> yeah. but at the same time, you know, um, you're not a complete mess with your health and you have uh, shortened telomeres and the whole nine yards by the time you graduate. So um, I think that we're, we're after um, creating the balance and, and the sort of basic skill set across these areas, like the, the neuroinflammation, the neuroinfections, um, you know, having pandas be a part of the conversation for uh, pediatric OCD or pediatric bipolar, this whole issue about nutrition and, you know, the depletion of soil and the environment and why um, in metabol uh, genomics of metabolism, why some people actually need higher doses of certain Mm -hmm. micronutrients. Um, and the RDA is uh, not a one-size-fits-all model and, and so forth and so on. And so I, I'm kind of um, relating to the fact that I think for physicians and, and other healthcare providers, a lot of times the journey toward um, becoming an integrative provider or a functional medicine provider often starts with a personal uh, experience or the experience with a family member where you really had to go the extra yard to, yeah. to get the answers. Well, you, you see that what you learned won't get you what you need. Yeah. Right? I mean, exactly. and, and it's, uh, I know for me, just my whole thing was always weight loss. Now I've never had weight loss issues. I was just fascinated with weight loss resistance. I thought it was so interesting. But then when my son went through what he went through, I'm like, all right, this is biochemistry. I can figure this out. Right. But I was just thinking about all the things that I had to do to get him to this place from the dietary shifts, the heavy metals, the GI issues, the hormonal issues that went down, hyperbaric and neurofeedback and, you know, stem cells. I mean, it, it's unbelievable the amount of things that when you really look at it, that to truly work in 
mental illness you really need to have, right? Yeah. It's, it's, you know, and to look at, I mean, it's so fascinating now what we're finding with the gut and what happens there. I mean, it's just incredible. But early on, I remember my son was at school and I got a call and they said, come pick up your son. He's climbing the walls. And I'm like, what is going on? And they'd given him a pound of bag of M&Ms because he won a contest. I mean, we, we know intuitively, you can't, every single mom knows intuitively that food affects their kids' mood. Absolutely. We all know it, right? Absolutely. So. Yeah. I mean, it should be the first step in trying to address behavioral issues in a child is to um, dramatically reduce sugar, in my opinion, and then look at screens and sleep. Oh, um, yeah. The screen. And that'll take care of now. most of it. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Well, if you fix, if you fix what's at the end of your fork, for most people, that alone makes such a dramatic shift. Um, but then you have a situation where the mom goes to the store and picks up the product that says no sugar added, not realizing that the apple juice concentrate that they put in there has actually more fructose and is higher in sugar than if they just gotten the thing with the, the sugar added, right? They Great think point. it's not sugar. Yeah. So, Absolutely. Yeah. JJ, we'll say, we'll say a little bit more about your how you talk about sugar now in general. Like, well, like what's your message about, first of all, we have to define what sugar is, but what's your exactly. message about <laughs> sugar? And maybe, um, you know, how are you speaking about carbs and more refined sugars specifically? And, and obviously there's a lot of refined sugars and a lot of products in this country. Um, well, yeah, think about it. So at the turn of the 19th century, the average person ate five pounds of sugar per year. And there was no obesity. Um, it was 0.2%. And now, it, at turn of 20th, it was 150 pounds of sugar per person per year. Um, you know, 35% obesity, 70% overweight or obese. Um, correlation? Yes. Causation? Yes. So, um, and the thing is, we're eating less table sugar than ever. Like, if you go to try and find sugar cubes, you can't even find them. But sugar sneaking into places that it should never be, just in case in point, you know, the mom in the aisle trying to get something healthy and thinks the fruit snacks are healthy for a kid because it says no sugar added. It's fruit, but it's not. It's fruit juice concentrate, right? So it's literally just candy. When we look at sugar, your body isn't going to tell the difference between it being refined or unrefined when it gets in your mouth. It's going to start to have the same process. And that's that's one of the big challenges. I literally was not very interested in sugar. I don't have a sweet tooth. I don't really, sugar is not my thing. And I never really paid too much attention to it. And when I wrote The Virgin Diet, you know, the book is written, Drop Seven Foods. Well, at first it was six foods. It was gluten, dairy, soy, corn, eggs, peanuts, because those were the ones that I saw showing up on the food sensitivity test and the gluten, the wheat test the most. So I was like, all right, Pulled those out. Well, what I discovered when I pulled those six out, if I didn't tell them sugar, then they just started eating a bunch of sugar. And the reality is sugar can create more food intolerance issues because of how it disrupts the gut microbiome. And fructose also makes the gut, the small intestine more permeable. So that's why I started including sugar. So I write the book. The number one question I get asked when I write The Virgin Diet is about sugar. I'm like, oh my gosh. They're like, honey, it's all natural. That's why I have that pet peeve there, Keith, about like, well, it's all natural. Well, the problem is it's still sugar. And remember, all carbohydrates except for fiber turn into sugar. It's really a matter of whether your body is making sugar slowly from the food you eat or mainlining it. And so we've really kind of messed it up talking about complex or simple carbs because you, a complex carb can still be made into sugar fairly quickly. So the first step in all of this is to unprocess your diet. You want to eat as close to nature as possible. Like if you look back, um, most of the sugar that's sneaking into our diet is really coming in the form of packaged foods. And most of this happened when 30 years ago, 40 years ago, all of that information started coming out that sugar was, um, that fat was creating heart disease. And so all of a sudden we were pulling fat out of food and putting sugar in to replace it because you got to put something in. And we started to talk about things being low fat. Well, they'd be low fat, but high sugar. And that's kind of ridiculous because if something's low fat and high sugar, it's really high body fat, right? Because 
sugar is going to make you store fat, especially around your waist. So that's the big challenge as we start to add sugar in and to places you wouldn't expect. So things like that light salad dressing that you think you're being so good having the salad. So you have the salad, you put dried fruit on there because it's just fruit, not realizing that dried fruit is candy. And then you have the glazed pecan. Glaze, of course, is code for candy. And then you have the raspberry vinaigrette. It's light, so it's better for you. It's light just means it's lower in fat, but it's high in sugar. And literally, that salad is now a sundae. You've got so much sugar in it. And then you look at things like the um, marinara sauce that they add a bunch of sugar to. In fact, the marinara sauce, the regular ones at the store, have more sugar in them than an equal serving of Oreo cookies. So that's the big challenge is you can think you're doing everything right. You can look at it and say, oh, I'm buying these healthy things. They can say no sugar added and still use things like fruit juice concentrate and have high sugar impact, have a load of sugar in it. Or you can be eating things like very refined flours and they're very quickly turned from carbohydrate into sugar in the body. And as you know, when you eat sugar, you raise blood sugar, which then raises insulin. And if you're eating little bits of sugar all throughout the day, you're going to keep your insulin up, which tells your body to store fat, not burn it. If you go and eat some of the lower glycemic offerings out there, thinking you're doing a better job, like you're having agave, et cetera, well, the challenge is those are high in fructose and fructose can only be metabolized by the liver. So fructose goes to the liver and if it can't be turned into glucose and stored as glycogen there, and it probably can't because there's not much room there, then it's turned into fat raises your triglycerides, can make you insulin resistant, can create fatty liver. I mean, we have non-alcoholic fatty liver. That should not exist. And we have it in kids because we're giving them apple juice, apple juice concentrate, fruit snacks, all this garbage, when the reality is you should only eat fresh or frozen fruit, no sugar added in small amounts. Fruit is not free food. If you look at like a um, thousand years ago, we have longer days in the summer. So we're sleeping less. So we're more insulin resistant. We have fruit. Why? So we could eat a bunch of fruit, store a bunch of fat, and make it through the winter when we can sleep more, be more insulin sensitive and burn off stored fat for fuel. Fruit is not a diet food. It's not dessert. It's, it's fruit using limited quantities. That's how you feel about sugar. So that's um, my fruit rant right there. Well, and, and don't good. even get started on artificial sweeteners because you guys are in the mental health field. Artificial sweeteners should be like, uh, they should be criminal. Yeah. Well, so, so actually, since we're, let's just hang with this nutrition conversation for a moment. So, um, so many different ways to eat, right? So many different ways we could eat as a human being, so many different mm -hmm. sort of diets, different food plans that we could try. Um, mm -hmm. And for the person who's out there, like really wanting to discover what's best for their body, how do you go about telling them where to start and be their own science experiment and not take 10 years to figure it out? Yes. So I actually wanted to create this discovery diet. That's so funny that you said that. I wrote this out. My agent's like, no. <laughs> but here's how I view this. Number one, we need two different words. A diet is something that you should do short term to learn about yourself, to get a therapeutic result, right? So let's say that you need to, um, you just got diagnosed with cancer or you just got diagnosed with high blood pressure, or your blood sugar is unstable, or you're trying to lose some belly fat. So you pick a diet to use it to learn some things. Then you have your eating plan. The problem is we use the same word. So that's super confusing. So I think of diets as something that you do therapeutically. The way I've written all my books they're not things that you do long-term. They're cycles that take you through a discovery cycle to learn something about yourself. So in my perfect world, here's how it would work. Number one, you would realize that your self-care is the most important thing that you can do and the biggest contribution you can make to society because you're no good if you're not, if you're not healthy. So your self-care would be number one because you know you're worth it. And then you would start with starting to add before you take away in your diet. Because if you look at little kids, why don't we feed them dessert first at dinner? Because they'll get full and they'll stop eating. So you start first by adding in important things. I think people should at least eat at least five servings of non-starchy vegetables a day. Ten would be better. So the first thing is start adding more non-starchy vegetables. Start drinking more pure water in between your meals. 
increase your fiber. So when you start to do this stuff, we can start to crowd some of the other stuff out. Then if you want to lose body fat, your body has to be able to detoxify well. If it can't detoxify well and you start freeing up body fat from your fat cells, you'll free up toxins and you'll make yourself worse, not better. So at the start of anything you're doing, you really want to make sure that you're supporting good detoxification. So as I start to write Virgin Diet 2.0, um, part of what the first week is, is a detoxification focus so that we make sure that we're really able to use those pathways well and detoxify well. So I like to have people start with figuring out their hidden food intolerances, which foods work for them, which foods don't. That's virgin diet, where you go through a process. And this is where food journals are key and critical. And weighing in every day is super critical and really looking at how you feel. So the first thing you do is pull out the foods that are most likely to cause problems. You swap in healing and detoxifying foods to help heal your gut while you're doing that and build that good gut microbiome that's so important for your mental health and your weight and your immune system. At the end of the time, you've gotten to a new normal or reset. I think most people have no idea what it feels like to feel really good. Now you're there. And what I hear so often from people is that they'll go on this type of a program to lose weight, but they stay because of how good they feel. At the time you've gotten to that reset, then you go back and you challenge those six foods. You don't need to challenge sugar. Just get the sugar out. Challenge those six foods and see how you feel. I believe most people in the United States, because of what we've done to the gluten, it's always like, is it gluten or is it glyphosate? Like, what's the real issue here? But you can't disconnect them, really. So I find in the U.S., because of glyphosate and the way we've um, genetically engineered our wheat to be more gluten-y, to be more insulinogenic is a problem. Um, and I think most of us do way better without gluten, without dairy, without soy, uh, corn is very GMO, so is soy. So, but I go back and have you connect those dots. Then you get to your new normal. Then I move you into sugar impact diet, getting you really clear on what should a plate look like? Why are you eating clean protein, healthy fats, uh, slow, low carbs with loads of non-starchy vegetables that have a lot of fiber? So that, that fiber, fat, and protein trifecta is really important for satiety and blood sugar balance, which is super key important. My son, one of the biggest triggers for him having any kind of explosive events was hypoglycemia. So it was like, how do you make sure we're keeping that blood sugar super stable? And that's not by eating every couple of hours. Snacking is, has been created by the snack food industry. When we pulled the fat out, we started getting people to snack. And that was the start of this whole obesity problem. Because every time you're eating, you're raising blood sugar, raising insulin, you're storing fat around your waistline, and you're locking the doors to your fat cells so you cannot burn fat off. So that's super key and critical. So one of the things I start having people do is stop eating three to four hours before bed, don't go to bed later, and get rid of the snacks, drink your fluids, especially water, a lot of that in between meals, and then start to have breakfast a little later as well. And so the next thing that I have people do is sugar impact diet, really identify where sugar sneaking in and see how they feel lowering their carbs. Because, you know, macronutrient ratios will shift depending on um, what you're going through, how much stress you're under, um, age, sex, genetics. So some people do better with a little more carbs, some people do better with less. And so the sugar impact diet helps you really key into that. And if you do want to go into intermittent fasting, which I think is a super powerful therapeutic tool um, and fasting, it prepares you to be able to be a fat burner so you can move into that and not crash. It prepares you if you do want to do some ketogenic cycles to move into that and not crash because that's something that you need to prepare for and move into to make that transition from your body being a sugar burner into a fat burner. So that's how I teach people. And then after that, it may be, you know, once you've gone through those, then it's playing around with intermittent fasting and fasting cycles, playing around potentially with um, a keto cycle done like my girlfriend, Dr. Anna Kabeca teaches keto green with a lot of green vegetables in there. So it's not a more acidic keto diet. So again, journaling all of this, connecting the dots, using a scale, using a food journal, looking at symptoms trackers so that you really start to identify how you feel when you do certain behaviors. So it doesn't become like, I'll have a cheat day or I was bad that day. It's like, when you learn things about yourself, like an adult will learn and go, oh, you know, I shouldn't drink a bottle of wine. I feel like crap when I do that. You know, it's the same thing with food. You start to go, oh, you know, when I ate that 
um, pizza, this is what happened. You got to connect those dots. Like my son Bryce gets migraines if he eats pizza. It took me like quite a while to get him to get that one, but he finally connected the dots. And so he eats gluten-free, dairy-free pizzas now. That's um, it's a hard one for me, uh, pizza and connecting the dots. There's a lot of resistance to uh, <laughs> in my, in <laughs> yeah, my there's, system. <laughs> there's cauliflower crust. There's amazing gluten-free crust. I know. There's, we, you know. we make our own cauliflower crust, crust at home and we, we try to work around it. Um, and pizza. <laughs> <laughs> we all we all have our thing. So, I will tell you what's found. Believe it or not, so einkorn wheat is a different type. It's non, you know, it has it's it's uh, wheat that hasn't been genetically heritage injured, wheat, right? right? Yeah. So I found a woman who makes einkorn wheat sourdough. So that basically is taking the gluten way down, and it's einkorn um, pizza crusts on Etsy. I'll have to get that link from you. Right? Isn't that crazy? <laughs> so we get those and it's amazing. So there you go. Probably the most be, uh, useful thing I've said the entire time, right? I'll, I'll probably be I'll probably be Googling that tonight. And my <laughs> wife is gonna roll over in bed and go, uh, oh, he's up to it again. <laughs> well, JJ, this has been um really uh, um a great conversation with you. I'm curious about what do you want people to know about what you're up to right now and anything you want to highlight? Um, right now I am deep in the, it's so funny. So here's what I've really been up to. I have been reorganizing my house because I'm getting ready to write a book. And, <laughs> and I can't write if my house is not absolutely 100% organized. So this is what I've been doing. I've been organizing in preparation to write this, uh, to, to give birth to Virgin Diet 2.0, um, which I'm super excited about. And, uh, and then of course... We've been doing all sorts of fun things over with our Mindshare Collaborative because of the pandemic allowing us to shift a lot of things because people started to accept that, oh, you can have events online and they can they can be amazing and we can really connect that way. So we've been doing a lot of cool things over there and big community building because that's the biggest thing that I see that we as practitioners need to do is stick together, collaborate, share ideas, a rising tide lifts all boats. JJ, why don't you take a couple minutes to share about Mindshare because this this podcast has a ton of uh, professionals that might be interested in it. Why don't you just take a couple minutes to say what it is? And sure, Mindshare it. is my um, gosh, it is my number one passion. And it years ago, I used to help doctors put nutrition into their practice, and I it was getting and I, then I started doing a lot of practice development with them, helping them create their brand and market because I got so frustrated being the most amazing, talented practitioners um, who who weren't sure how to get the word out about themselves. It's like nothing you're ever taught in school. Um, then I started doing more like I never taught anything that I wasn't doing myself, so I got on TV. I was on Dr. Phil. I did a, I did a book. I did a PBS show. And then that all that side of my business took off. And so then I just was like, oh, I better focus over there. But meanwhile, the doctors I had been coaching before were like, what are you doing? And I go, I can't teach you yet. I'm not ready. Well, then I started to really get clear on it. And the first thing I knew was that we needed a community and we needed a community to share best practices, to share, you know, how you can build a brand, how you can do books, how you can do speaking, how you can do TED Talks, how you can do summits and podcasts and uh, move your business online, how to do virtual, how to create multiple streams of income. And so that's really what Mindshare Collaborative is. It's a group of like-minded practitioners. And I say like-minded because I think that um, kind of the old school of practitioners is that we are built to compete and that you go to one person and you go to another person for a second opinion. And in the new school, people collect and they collaborate. When you look at it, if someone's trying to lose weight in my area, they're not going to buy one diet book. They're not going to do one diet program. You know, my greatest um, collaborators have been Dr. Mark Hyman, Dr. Sarah Godfrey, Dr. Anna Kabeca, people that were very similar in thought process to me and we share those audiences. So that's Really what Mindshare was built to do was for everyone to share their best practices, to support each other. And gosh, you know what? The biggest thing is to know that you're not alone. 
uh, number one subject line, open subject line of all time is you are not alone. And I think it can be lonely out there as you're building this business, right? And to know that you have other people that you can share with and share some of the crazy stuff that goes on is fantastic. Right. Well, we end with uh, a, a question with every guest, which is if you had a billboard that had a paragraph on it that every human being would see one time in their life, what message would you want them to hear from you? So there's two parts to this. Um, when my mentor, my when I was 30 with Kay Smith, one of the things she taught me back then was don't wish it was easier. Make yourself stronger. And I remember thinking that over and over and over again when my son was in the hospital. I was like, okay, don't wish it was easier. Make yourself stronger. I, I will tell you, I wished it was a little easier. Um, but I was like, okay, make myself stronger. And it was interesting. The night Grant walked out and got hit by the car, we were in a big fight. He stomped out. And the last thing I said to Grant was, Grant, you are stronger than you think. And I kept telling him that. And I think for so many of us, you know, we're never better than when we're challenged, right? That's when we really grow. And so do not wish it was easier. Make yourself stronger. And by the way, you are so much stronger than you think. Awesome. Thanks so much for joining us on this on the show, JJ. Well, thanks, thanks so much JJ. for doing what you guys are doing. It is like I just wish you'd been doing it, you know, 20 years ago. <laughs> I'm right, glad we're you're making doing up for lost now. time. Yeah. <laughs> right. Trying to. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's great to meet you and um good to connect with you.